Another great story from the Gospel of Luke. Then they arrived at the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite of Galilee. And he stepped out on land, a man of the city, who had demons, met him. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he did not live in a house, but in the tombs. And when he saw Jesus, he fell down before him and shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many times it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the wild. Jesus then asked him, What is your name? And he said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. They begged him not to order them to go back into the abyss. Now there on the hillside, a large herd of swine was feeding, and the demons begged Jesus to let them enter these, so he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the swine herd saw what had happened, they ran off and told in the city and in the country. Then people came out to see what had happened, and when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told them how the one who had been possessed by demons had been healed. And all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them. For they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. If you drive up uh, 33 Broadway, Maynardville Highway, you're going to hit 441 and just a big traffic mess, a big mess. Who drives through there relatively frequently? Okay, it's a big mess. I mean, they're curving the road or making it easier to turn or widen it or something. But they haven't even got to that part yet because the whole year has been underground. What they want to do is just, you know, make it a little easier to travel. But to do that, they got to do so many other things first. They've been digging culverts and rerouting creeks and building foundations and putting all this infrastructure in. You want to do one thing, but to do the one thing, so many other things need to do. Nothing simple. It's all complicated. After working on renovating three houses now, my wife and I have a mantra. Whenever you want to do anything in an old house, you say, nothing is simple. For instance, we wanted to move a toilet, an old toilet that wasn't working right. It was old. It was too small. I'm six and a half feet tall. These old people, I mean, you know, last generations were short people. I needed a bigger toilet. So we're like, I'm just going to move this toilet. I'm going to take this toilet and move it somewhere else. You get a new toilet and you realize, ah. Oh, what well, should have been a simple job isn't a simple job because toilets have changed. What used to be a 10-inch offset from the wall is now a 12-and-a-half or 13-inch offset. All right, so now I've got to move the hole, which means I've got to change the plumbing. So you go underground and you have to change the plumbing. You buy a bunch of PVC, and it's not PVC. It's cast iron. So then you've got to join your PVC to your cast iron, and you do that, and then you realize, wait, there's a joist in the way. I mean, nothing is easy, but to move the joist, you've got to deal with the electric wires that go through the joist. And to move that, you've got to deal with the plumbing line that runs along the joist. And you, next thing you know, you build a new house. All you wanted to do was move a toilet. That's what I tell people when they ask us why we're still renovating our house. We need a new bathroom. Nothing's easy. It's all complicated. That's my message to you this morning. What seems like a simple thing, what seems like one issue, one single issue, maybe one single individual, is actually a legion of things. The multitude of things. Things are connected. It's not simple. And as Christians, let's not simplify. Let's not simplify the truth because it makes us feel good. Jesus gets out of the boat on the other side. He's out of Jerusalem, out of Israel. He is in Gentile territory. It's the gospel's way of saying he is an un charted waters. He is in the unclean territory. He is outside the comfort zone, outside the place that he knows, into the place that he doesn't know. And he is met there by a man, a man who comes hollowing out of the tombs. He's possessed by a demon, many demons. And he knows who Jesus is. The question isn't, who are you? It's, what are you going to do with me? Do not torment me, Jesus. I don't want to go back to the abyss. 
It appears that Jesus already tried to exercise the demon, but the demon's not so ready to go. He's fighting. He's given up. He's not given up this vessel, this man, too easily. So Jesus enters into a conversation with the demon, which in itself is pretty interesting. What, what, what do they call you? What's your name? My name is Legion, for we are many. We are many. Here you have a single individual, but it's not a single individual. It's many individuals. There's many places you could do with that. Are you of many minds? I'm often of many minds. But in the context of this story, I think it's an indication that what appears to be simple, what appears to be a single problem, is actually multiple problems connected, multiple things going on. And this, this reality is heightened by this conundrum of the pigs. The story would be relatively straightforward if the man said, I am legion, I am many, and Jesus says, well, legion, into the abyss with you. And that, with a great howling, he threw the man on the ground, and the demon came out of him, or the unclean spirits came out of him, and went back to where they belong, and he was in his right mind, and everyone lived happily ever after. The townsfolk would have probably been thrilled if their friend and their neighbor had been restored to his right mind when they came and found him. But we have this pig issue. I mean, what's up with the pigs? When the, when the Bible gives you a red herring, something that doesn't seem to fit, pay attention. Because maybe the Holy Spirit is trying to teach us something. I think part of the problem is that we see this story about a healing of a man. But it's really a story of what it means to heal a society. You can't just heal individuals. You have to heal the systems and structures and places and contexts and cultures of which they are a part. Let me give you an entry point with Alcoholics Anonymous, an AA group. A person might eventually come to the place where they're like, I have a problem, I have a drinking problem. What I need to do is I need to give up alcohol. So they go to AA and they're there to give up alcohol. That's why they think they're going. They're going to give up alcohol. I cannot drink. That's what needs to change. I need to stop reaching for the bottle. But most alcoholics will tell you if that is why the person came, that's fine. But if that's all they leave with is that I need to stop drinking, then they're going to continue to have problems because there are layers of problems that have led to the drinking, that have led to the disease of alcoholism. And people who are faithful to the program, whatever kind of treatment program they're in, are going to have to deal with whatever it is that has led them to the place where they find themselves drinking a lot. They've got to deal with past abuses. They've got to deal with past failures. They've got to deal with their history. They've got to deal with where they've come from and why they're here. They've got to learn to forgive others. They've got to learn to forgive themselves. And, after, and as they do that, they discover they can deal with with the drinking, or the drugs, or whatever addiction it is they're facing. Some of you might have encountered people who are no longer drinking, no longer doing drugs, but they still have the attitude and the persona and the characteristics of being an alcoholic. Because they haven't dealt with everything else. They haven't dealt with the rest of the... They, they just dealt with the surface. They didn't go underground and move the joist. And move the old wiring and change the plumbing. The pigs, I think, are an indication to us that Jesus hasn't come in coming to heal and to liberate and to, and to restore individuals. You're not going to be able to do that without healing, liberating, and restoring society. In the context of the story, the pigs are a representation of all that is unclean with Gentile, with the Gentile world and the Gentile culture and the Gentile life. In Israel, it was the temple. You know, Jesus, if he just came to liberate individuals and to save individuals and to help individuals, he wouldn't have had to come to the temple, toss over the money changers, and prophecy that it was all going to become tearing down. The Bible wanted to tell us that the, the shroud of the temple was torn in two upon his death. The temple itself wouldn't have had to be judged and condemned. Because to liberate the individual, to free the individual, Jesus needed to restore the society. 
The pigs are a sign that the liberation and healing of this man is bigger than just this man, than just this individual. A harder, maybe, a more deeper example. Us men, we're, we're teachers, all right? Teachers. I've had a, a theory late, uh, over the past couple of years listening to how teachers are talked about uh, is that everyone thinks they can teach. I mean, teaching is easy, right? You, you, you go into the classroom, you have your 25 kids sit down, you have them get their paper and their pencil out, you have them get their book out, you make sure they hand in their assignments, you grade their assignments, you stand in front of the chalkboard or the whiteboard or the Prometheus board, you do your thing, you educate, you, you, you give them the information you have, you make sure everyone's got it, and you move on to the next class. And everyone, what's so hard about teaching? The No Child Act, the No Child, Leave No Child Behind Act, was that almost 10, 12 years ago? How much, how long ago was that? Had a good, had a good desire. It looked at kids and it said, man, there's all these kids in these really largely poor communities that are really falling behind all these kids who are not in poor communities. These kids are good kids. These kids can learn. These kids are, are capable and have brains and, and have potential. We need to get these kids to learn, well, what's the problem? It must be teachers. Teachers must be the problem. We need to, we need to look at our teachers. We need to hold our teachers accountable. We need, to, we, need to, we need to assess their ability to teach and review it and support them, but also uh, you know, have more freedom, have more ability to, to get rid of the bad teachers so the kids can learn. It was a good desire. The problem is it was almost completely wrong. Because... Kids are not kids are not kids. It is true that teachers are not teachers are not teachers. But the simple desire, hey, we need to educate our kids, and all kids can learn, therefore it must be the teacher's fault, doesn't take into account all the research of what it takes for a kid to learn. It's not easy to educate kids. It's incredibly complicated and hard, especially with what kids go through nowadays. You know what they've done? They have done study after study after study where they try to incentivize learning. They say maybe the problem is that kids don't have enough incentive to learn. They have spent literally millions of dollars paying kids to learn. They've gone to these big school districts and said, okay, for every A you get, we're going to pay you. And they've even paid parents for their kids' grades. If your kids do well, we're going to pay you. We're going to incentivize learning. Because this follows a very simple idea. And the idea is this. Reward, good behavior, good behavior follows. Punish, bad behavior, people won't do bad behavior. It's a very simple idea, right? Probably most of us have grown up with this idea. Reward, good behavior, punish, bad behavior. It doesn't work at all. After all the years of studies, paying kids to learn and paying parents to have their kids learn makes absolutely no difference. And you know what else doesn't work? Disciplining kids to learn doesn't work either. So they've done this. They said, we're going to make school so strict. You dress this way, you walk this way, you speak this way, you answer questions this way, you read your book this way, you do your homework this way. It makes absolutely no difference to whether kids come under. There's something else going on. A simple issue, one thing, is actually a legion of things. You want to liberate the potential of just children to achieve is absolutely... This whole network, this whole conundrum, this incredibly big problem, this infrastructure problem. Here's one example. We have recently, made, the, research, you know, the, the research seems pretty clear. All right? The idea that you reward good and punish bad is counterintuitive with kids who are struggling in school. People who grow up in high-stress environments, like poor environments, where there's a lot of chaos, a lot of upheaval, a lot of struggle, a lot of instability. High-stress environments are hardwired to have a sensitive fight-and-flight response. It changes their neurological patterns. It affects the way where you are born, how you are raised, affects a whole multitude of things. It affects their neurological system. They're, they're, they're more sensitive to stress. Therefore, they're more sensitive to fight or to flee. There is no, if you wanted to invent a stressful environment for a kid, invent junior high school. Who wants to go back to junior high? I mean, why do we keep doing it? Mark does. <laughs> it was good. 
Who wants to, why do we keep doing this work? And so here, under the, under the simple truth that, hey, we got a problem. This kid's a problem. He's causing disturbance in class. Well, let's make it, let's make it, let's make it painful to disturb the class. Let's punish the child. A kid that has a, a sensitivity to fight and flight, already in a stressful environment, the stress of social stigma, the stress of clothes, the stress of school, the stress of failure, the stress of not being smart enough, they're already floundering. And now you make it harder because they didn't turn their assignment. They didn't do a good job in their assignment. They didn't respond the right way. They didn't talk the right way. Under the simple truth, under these simple ideas, you've now increased their stress. You're increasing their fight and flight response. And now they're either going to care less about school or they're going to fight back harder. So taking a very simple truth to a very complex problem is a legion of problems. You've made things harder. You've made things harder for that kid. You've self you, you, you've taken the, I mean, it's, it's self-defeating. When what you really need to be looking at is what does poverty do to a child? How do you, how do you support that child outside of their home? How do you change the infrastructure of that child's life? Which is why schools need social workers. Schools need therapists. But why schools are kind of the, the portal to one of the great needs of life, one of the great entry points of, of how you get affected with kids' life. I mean, teachers go in, they want to educate their kids, and the next thing they do is they're buying clothes for their kids, and they're paying for kids' lunches because they know that these are more complicated issues. It's a legion of issues. And as Christians, as followers of Christ, we have this, this little microcosm of story. Do you want to help someone? Well, you might understand that it's not just one thing that you're dealing with. You could be dealing with a whole multitude of things going on in this person's life, a whole legion of things. And to liberate that person, there might be something that's connected to that person's life, a system and a structure that's part of the problem. Can you imagine the swine herd's reaction and the townsfolk reaction when their whole herd of pigs rush down into the sea and drown? Those pigs are food. That's literally life for someone. It's financial stability. It's income. Jesus is responsible for destroying someone's income, someone's meal. That, those pigs represent, they're valuable to a society. As we look at issues, that are facing our society through the people that we want to help, we might end up actually disrupting systems and monetary systems and, and, and value systems that some people consider are really, really good, but in fact are part of a larger, a larger structure of brokenness. Taking into account the murder in Orlando last week. You had a deranged individual, highly unstable, deranged individual for one reason or another, probably a legion of reasons. And you want to make sure as best as you can that that doesn't occur any other moment. And you want to make sure that's never happened again. How are you going to, as followers of Christ, how are you going to entertain, how are you going to come to that issue and these deranged people, are you just going to treat them as individual ent entities? You've got to put them in jail, lock every deranged individual up, make stronger laws so people with psychopathic tendencies are better contained or, or have their liberties reduced. Are you going to arm more people or disarm more people? Because here, through this person, we see real brokenness. The reality is, as followers of Christ, when we encounter these difficult issues, we need to understand that there's a legion of issues behind that individual, and that there's structures and systems and cultures and customs and ideas and values, some of which some people are going to consider really, really good and important that might also need to be liberated or exercised. Because the pigs running into the water was an exorcism of the land. 
It was a cleaning of the land. And when Jesus comes, He doesn't just fix people. He fixes the land and the, the society around. What does that look like? I don't know. I don't know what that means. You and I support in the form of public policy, but it's not an individual thing. This individual, this, this very sad, deranged individual who did this horrible thing, if we treat him and the people like him as sole players, as individuals, without looking at the context at which they exist, and the brokenness of our society, and say, what, do, what else need we clean out? Then we're, we're not getting very far. We're not getting It's one of the reasons, I think, that we here at Northside don't use as a confession of faith in joining both the faith or the church, my personal Lord and Savior. We give the, the Peter confession here at church. If you were to come forward this morning, I would ask you, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God? You might be familiar with what's missing, my personal Lord and Savior. I'm okay with that on a lot of levels, but I'm not okay with it ultimately as a public confession because Jesus isn't just here for you as a person, you as an individual. It is true, it's just not the whole truth. The truth is that Jesus is here for all of us, you in connection with other things. Jesus is the social Lord. I take Jesus as the world's Lord and Savior. I take Jesus as the public Lord and Savior. I take Jesus as my total existence Lord and Savior. Just not my personal Lord and Savior. Do as you please. When Jesus got off the boat and got on land, the garrison demonic did not come to him and say, what are you going to do with me, Jesus? And Jesus says, that you're not my business. I got nothing today. I'm uh, clocked out. The followers of Christ and the Spirit of Christ we don't turn a blind eye to where uncleanliness is in life, where brokenness is in life, where the demonic and the self-destructive live in life. We have to engage. We have to engage. Because we are public servants. It is about us. Us. It's complicated. As followers of Christ, have the humility to look at these issues and not try to boil it down to one single simple truth. That is probably true. It's just in no way the whole truth. Broaden your minds. See what else needs to be exercised. Why is this man deranged? Where did he come from? How are we all involved and invested. The townsfolk were afraid of Jesus. Isn't that amazing? They were afraid. I think they were afraid because they knew that it wasn't just going to stop with this man. And they didn't want they didn't want the rest of it. They would have rather dealt with the single deranged individual from time to time who they couldn't control than deal with all the brokenness that is part of their society. Is that possible? Is that true for us? They say, Jesus, can you just go away? We'll deal with the pain that comes from when a few radical individuals do horrible things. We don't want to deal with looking at our whole society. The pigs are there for a purpose. Ask yourself, what is that purpose? as you consider the message to you from God this morning.